Hello students, this is Professor Del Russo and this lecture is about the common forms of child protection litigation. I'm going to focus primarily on child protection litigation within the family court. Nevertheless, let's take a look at the types of proceedings throughout all of child protection that can occur within the family court and the criminal court. Within the family court, you have what's known as the initial filing, also called the order to show cause. Once that's filed, you have the return on the order to show cause. Later on, there is the possibility of the fact-finding hearing, and later on, the permanency hearing. And in some cases, unfortunately, it may progress to termination of parental rights and a guardianship trial. Within the criminal courts, you have the grand jury hearing in New Jersey, and if there's no resolution, the criminal trial. An initial filing happens in the Superior Court Chancery Division family part. Every county has a family part which has jurisdiction over abuse and neglect cases. The statute tells us that whenever a child abuse report is made, the division shall immediately take action that shall be necessary to ensure the safety of the child. And that action happens in a courtroom through the use of what's called an initial filing. The purpose of testimony in initial filings are to provide material and relevant evidence that supports the entry of an emergent order. And you'll see in a moment that these orders are emergent. There's an emergency that needs to be taken care of. There is a high risk situation. They are usually orders requesting custody but they can be for care and supervision or injunctive relief. Injunctive relief might include barring one parent or the other from the family home, limiting access to the family home, and things like that. The overall goal is to protect the child at risk of abuse or neglect. Now, there are two scenarios for an initial filing, and you need to pay attention to this. The first scenario is where the child remains in the home while the division applies for an emergent order. The second scenario is, and perhaps the more common, is where the child is removed before the division applies for emergent relief. Now, I say the division applies. A deputy attorney general, also called a DAG, is the lawyer for the Division of Child Protection and Permanency, and they are the persons who will file the verified complaint and start the initial filing process. Let's take a look at the initial filing elements. The family court can enter an emergency order after a DOD removal, and that's the scenario where the child has already been removed and the division's going to the court to ask for the emergency order and to approve the removal that has already occurred, or upon the filing of an order to show cause and verified complaint directing the immediate and temporary removal of a child. Now that second part, after the disjunctive or, speaks to those situations where the child remains in the home and the division is asking for relief and the court's order to allow the division to immediately and temporarily remove the child. Now, the court can enter that emergency order if the parent was informed of the division's intent to apply for the order. And in the case where the child was already removed, the division will have to show that they have made a good faith effort to notify the parent that they have in fact removed the child. So if they have not yet removed the child, they have to tell the parent they're going to try to get the court to allow the division to remove the child. Or if the child was already removed, they have to tell the parent, listen, we removed the child and we're going to go to court and have a hearing on whether we did the right thing and what the future looks like. So in either case, you have to notify the parent about the process. The second element is that the parent's abuse or neglect requires the immediate removal to avoid imminent danger to the child. Now, as I've said, immediate and imminent are adjectives that have significant meaning in this process the judge has to be convinced that the removal has to happen now. And it has to happen now because there is imminent danger, danger that's going to happen right away to the child unless there's some kind of intervention. And the last element for the initial filing is there's not enough time to hold the hearing. 
Let's take a closer look at the statute on the removal process where the child is removed without court authorization and then the division goes and asks for approval and an order confirming what happened. We call that a Dodd removal. Now Dodd is merely division jargon. It's a um, inside Dyfus word that describes uh, the person who was the primary sponsor of the statute some years ago. Senator Frank Dodd was uh, one of the sponsors of the statute that allows child protection to remove a child on an emergent basis without any court intervention and then has a process for going to court to have the court review what the division did. So a Dodd removal can happen if there's imminent danger to the child's life, safety, or health and there is insufficient time to apply for a court order. The child is removed without the consent of the parent or guardian the division does not have to show they made reasonable efforts to prevent placement. This is the only context in which DIFUS, at least in these early stages, are not required to provide reasonable efforts to prevent placement. Federal law requires reasonable efforts in all other situations involving division intervention, but not now. And the parent is to be notified as soon as possible of the placement. Now, I showed you what the elements of the initial filing were earlier. An initial filing is essentially a civil order to show cause. Orders to show cause occur not only in the family court, but throughout civil litigation. And an order to show cause essentially says there's an emergency happening. We don't have time to have a complete hearing. Something terrible will happen unless we get immediate relief. And there's not enough time to get into the lawyering aspects here and all the nuances and issues that arise with a full due process hearing. And in order to do so, you have to show four things under civil and family law. One, show that your argument's probably a winner. You're probably going to succeed and show that there was a serious danger about to happen. You must show a reasonable probability of success on the merits. You must show potential irreparable harm if the court doesn't issue the order. Something terrible will happen to the child. The child may be sexually assaulted or the child may be severely injured. You have to show that if DIFUS did not intervene and if the court doesn't issue this order, bad things will happen. And the last two almost always are found, if you can show the first two, you have to show that granting the order to show cause will result in a greater benefit to the children than harm to the parent, and that it's in the public interest. This is a good thing to do, it's a necessary thing to do, uh, and it must be done. So when one of these orders to show cause are filed, who are the people within the courtroom? Who are the courtroom participants that are involved in an initial filing? Well, the judge, obviously, the deputy attorney general, or as we call them, the DAG, who is the attorney who represents the interests of the Division of Child Protection and Permanency. There may be the law guardian. There may be representation for the parents from the Office of Parental Representation. There might even be private counsel for the parents. And there will be a DIFUS caseworker or DCPMP caseworker. Now, as you see, I may slip and say DIFUS from time to time. We all know that the name was changed a couple of years ago and they are interchangeable for our purposes. So the courtroom participants are the judge, the DAG, the law guardian, an attorney from OPR, possibly private lawyers, and either an intake worker or a sprue worker, that is a caseworker from the division. The typical initial filing involves that first hearing, which is a reasonable belief or probable cause standard. The division must show through the DAG that there is a reasonable belief that the child would be at risk of harm if action is not taken. DCPMP is the entity filing the complaint and they're asking the court for an order either approving what DCPMP did or requiring the caregiver to do something, to take some kind of action. For example, we want the court to approve the removal of the child. We found the child in their baby carriage 
on the edge of Route 287, and the mom was in a crack house and arrested by the police. So the child was taken, placed somewhere for the child's safety. Uh, there was no court order. It was an emergency removal. And now at the initial filing phase, we want the court to approve that action, to approve DCPMP's intervention. Or let's say there is an allegation that the stepfather has sexually abused the stepdaughter. The division is involved and they want the stepfather to move out of the house, to live somewhere else while the criminal prosecution is going on, assuming that there isn't a bail condition which requires the same kind of thing. In any event, that's an example of the division asking the court at the initial filing stage to require the caregiver to keep dad out of the house. Again, in the typical initial filing, the sprue worker or intake worker and investigating worker will testify. And they'll testify about the following, the referral facts. You know, why are we here today? What gave rise to this investigation? What is the abuse or neglect that was reported to the division that caused the action? Also, any family history with DCPMP. And we're talking about history separate and apart from the instant case, from the case that is the subject of the initial filing. For example, to trace my hypothetical again, if a child in the baby carriage was left uh, on the shoulder of Route 287 and the mom is in a crack house, well, that's part of the referral facts. And if mom had another child and that child was taken away from her and eventually her parental rights were terminated, the judge at the initial filing wants to know about that. That's relevant. Any family history with DCPMP. And if during that process, the division learned that mom has a history of uh, mental health issues, uh, a history of non-compliance with the division, uh, a history of not going to uh, uh, therapeutic appointments or following up on mental health counseling with the prior case involving a different child, that's fair game. That's something that's in the typical initial filing and the judge can take that into account when uh, making a decision. And of course, the circumstances of the incident that triggered the filing, which is related to the referral, uh, the circumstances of how that child was left on 287, what time of day or night was it? Um, where was the crack house that mom was at? Where exactly was she? What was she doing when she was found? You know, what were the circumstances of the incidents that triggered the filing? And from a litigation perspective, hearsay is permissible. Now we are not talking about hearsay in any detail right now, but generally speaking, hearsay are statements of third parties that are offered in the courtroom to prove the truth of the matter. There are statements that are made outside the courtroom offered in the courtroom to prove the truth of the matter. So if the division spoke to the mom's uh, therapist about whether she's been going to her appointments or not, and the worker testifies at the initial filing about what the therapist told her, that would be hearsay because the therapist isn't in court. The therapist is a third party who made a statement outside the courtroom. The therapist told mom, hey, she hasn't been coming to her appointments. I followed up on the telephone and uh, when she uh, answers the phone, she keeps hanging up on me. If the intake worker or the sprue worker at the initial filing testifies about what the therapist told her, that would be hearsay. Generally, hearsay is inadmissible unless there's an exception. In this case, in an initial filing, the law allows for hearsay to be admissible. So it's an exception and hearsay is permissible at the initial filing. These hearings are normally short hearings. There can be some cross-examination. That is, the lawyer for the caregiver or persons other than the division can question any of the witnesses in the case. Usually the OPR attorney, the caregiver's attorney, the mom's attorney, in the example I gave you, would be able to ask some questions. It is not that extensive because that attorney doesn't know a heck of a lot about the case. Uh, they haven't gotten what's called discovery or the reports and documents that um, make up the file. So uh, there's not going to be extensive cross-examination by the OPR attorney. Nevertheless, many of them are seasoned. They've been around. 
and uh, without even having the file, uh, they know sums of the kinds of questions that may be relevant, and they may ask those kinds of questions. The hearing will take place whether the caregiver is there or not. Now, remember, we're supposed to notify that caregiver that we took the child or that we're going to take the child. And that could be as, um, uh, um, that could involve just leaving the uh, documents at the caregiver's last known address. Uh, or giving the documents to the caregiver's landlord who's going to give them to the caregiver, the caregiver's mother. Uh, there has to be some attempt at notice, uh, but it is not um, uh, something that's dispositive. It's not something that's going to um, cause the initial filing to be dismissed or suspended in any way. And that's why sometimes the caregiver is not there. In fact, many times the caregiver is not there, uh, depending upon how serious the allegations are. Uh, how dysfunctional the caregiver is. So that hearing is going to take place. And the issue for the court is, what was known to the division when the action was taken? For example, the child was removed. What did the division know? What were the facts upon which they took that action? And that's what the court wants to know about, okay? Now, has there been a reasonable effort to avoid removal? Again, if it's a Dodd, if it's an emergent application and the child was left on the side of Route 287, that's not going to be a consideration. Uh, that's a consideration in most other cases, but not in the case of an emergent removal. Uh, if this wasn't an emergent removal where the child was taken before the division went to court, then there has to be a reasonable effort to rem avoid removal. The division has to show that they engaged in some kind of interaction with the caregiver uh, to reduce the risk of harm to that child, and um, it didn't work out. Uh, there was a reasonable effort to avoid removal, but it didn't work out. And is it contrary to the welfare of the child to remain with or be returned to the parent if the child was removed? Uh, those are the big issues for the court, and the court then will make an order. Now, once the court enters an order, they will always have what's called a return date, because remember, no one's really in a position to litigate this. These are emergent applications where the facts are very fluid and no one is in a real position to engage in a meaningful litigation. So the order to show cause will have what's called a return date whereby the parties will come back and then the uh, matter will be investigated and the litigation will be um, more informed. So on the return date for the order to show cause, you're going to have a hearing that's very similar to the initial application, but we'll know a lot more. We'll know a lot more. There will be some reports prepared. We'll know more about mom and her situation. We'll know more about the child's status and the prior history. Uh, the files will have been pulled. Perhaps there will have been some consulting with uh, law enforcement if law enforcement was involved. The police reports may come in if somebody filed a report because the child was on the roadside. So in that case, there's going to be a more extensive cross-examination and the worker can be cross-examined about where the child is now, what that placement is, and what kind of services are being offered. Again, the focus isn't so much about whether the abuse or neglect has happened. That's in the next kind of litigation that I'm going to describe to you but the court wants an update on what's going on in this case where the child was left on the side of the road. Where is the child now? What kind of services are being offered? It too is a brief hearing. And if the caregiver uh, wants to challenge that, well, that, that awaits uh, the next kind of hearing. And as I just suggested, the return involves a progress report to the court. And normally the judge enters an order to get uh, services in place in the home, to continue the placement, and any additional things that the judge may deem necessary based upon uh, the better information that we have on this return date. So imagine you are a division worker and you're going to testify in one of these initial filings. Well, what kinds of things are going to happen? Let's recap what it looks like um, for the worker, from the worker's perspective as a witness, uh, what it looks like when you testify in an initial filing. Well, the worker will be questioned about whether they attempted to notify the parents of the hearing, right? That's one of the requirements. Essentially, uh, the witness from the division is going to be queried, questioned, uh, 
about all the things that are required in an initial filing. So did you attempt to notify the parents of the hearing or the parent? What was the basis for the abuse or neglect? Why was the immediate removal necessary? If there is irreparable harm, what was the basis for that rep irreparable harm? And I can't say if, there's always irreparable harm in an order to show cause. So the court needs to know what the basis was for that and why it was contrary to the welfare of the child to be with the parent, the prior history with DCPMP, and whether there were considerations about placing the child with kin or relatives. So that's what I would call an initial filing witness checklist. That's the kinds of things that witnesses in an initial filing are going to be asked about. And invariably that witness is either the sprue worker or the case worker who is involved in the case. Now, in many cases, the parent, uh, the person who's subject to a division intervention is going to agree that they engaged in the conduct which gave rise to abuse or neglect. They're not going to challenge the facts. They're not going to say, I did not abuse the child or I did not neglect the child. Their focus in many cases is on the services, accepting the services from the division, complying with the services, and doing what is necessary to reduce or eliminate the original harm. And if that kind of cooperation happens, well, then eventually the child may be returned or whatever restrictions or requirements are placed on the caregiver may be modified or eliminated. So in uh, many cases, uh, the parent agrees that there was abuse or neglect. But sometimes the parent challenges the division's finding. They challenge their jurisdiction. The parent wants a fact finding. And that's the next kind of hearing, the fact finding. Let's take a closer look at the fact finding. The purpose of the fact finding is to determine whether a child is abused or neglected under the statute. It typically occurs within 120 days from the filing of the initial complaint. Now for division workers, there's something called the four tier finding process. That's an investigative protocol and that's not involved here. And it's not something non difus workers need to worry about. But if you are a division worker, uh, bear in mind that the fact finding doesn't involve your four tier analysis. It's quite different in a way. The court's goal their sole reason for hearing the evidence is to determine whether a child has been abused or neglected. This allows the family court to have continuing jurisdiction over the family. They have that initial emergency jurisdiction because there was imminent harm to the child. But now the division, in order to exercise continuing control over the family or the caregiver, has to convince the court that the original abuse or neglect in fact happened. There are two possible outcomes. Either the abuse happened or it did not happen. That's what a fact finding is. And the term fact finding is a bit of a misnomer. Uh, in other words, it's, it's not really the best characterization of what this proceeding is. It probably should be called a trial because that's what it is. It is a civil trial of abuse or neglect. And the burden of proof in this civil trial, as all civil trials, not all civil trials, many civil trials, is preponderance of the evidence. And burdens of proof are important in all litigation. Where the burden of proof is significant, the movant, the person who filed the complaint or takes the action, has a tougher road to hoe. They have a lot more work ahead of them. Uh, it requires more evidence. So in the criminal courts, for example, the burden of proof, as many of you know, is beyond a reasonable doubt. That requires significantly persuasive proof. Now, not to suggest that a fact-finding or civil hearing on abuse or neglect is a fait accompli, uh, that it's very easy. It's not very easy. However, the burden of proof there is a lot less than a criminal case. It's what we call preponderance of the evidence. And uh, to put it differently, it means that there is more evidence that shows that abuse happened than didn't happen. If you think of a percentage, it's 51%, a little bit more than half, slightly more than half. 
So burden of proof is preponderance of the evidence that a little bit more than half of the evidence suggests that abuse or neglect did happen. So now we're in the fact finding. What specifically does child protection have to prove? Well, it depends upon the behavior. It depends upon the allegation. To use my example again, where the mom is at the crack house and she left her baby in a stroller on the shoulder of Route 287, there the allegation would probably be neglect and maybe abandonment. It depends upon the facts and how detailed they are and a number of different factors. But there are all kinds of ways that caregivers can be abusive or neglectful of their children. I'm going to go over some of the strict definitions that guide us in child protection. And these definitions matter. As you recall, our first um, learning module was all about definitions. Definitions are very important in litigation and in child protection and in children within the justice system. So let's take a look at some of the definitions of abuse or neglect. Well, some of the statutes focus on affirmative conduct and some of them focus on omissions. The very important thing to remember about parents are that they have a legal duty to care for their children. Most of the time, the law doesn't punish people for things that they don't do. But where you have a duty, for example, you have a duty to file income taxes. And if you don't file an income tax, if you don't file your income taxes, you can be charged with a crime and there can be civil litigation as well. And in that case, you didn't do something. You're being charged for not doing something. Most of the time, we can't be held accountable under the criminal law or even the civil law for not doing something unless there's a specific duty that either a law, a statute imposes upon us or a duty uh, that arises uh, morally or ethically that's recognized by the law, like parenting, like parenting. Parents have a duty to care for their children, right? So let's take a closer look at this statute here. Um, it can be abuse or neglect when someone inflicts or allows to be inflicted upon a child physical injury that's not an accident and that injury causes or creates a substantial risk of death or serious or protracted disfigurement or protracted impairment of a physical or emotional health of the child or protracted loss or impairment of the function of any bodily organ. Now there's a lot going on in that statute. Uh, and it covers a lot of outcomes. Uh, nevertheless, the DAG and the division, when they are trying to prove abuse or neglect under this particular section of child protection law, would have to show that the elements of that statute have been met. Now, this is primarily an affirmative conduct statute because it really addresses parents who do something to the child, who injure the child by other than accidental means. Although it could be an omission if the parent allows someone else to inflict that injury on them. So this statute covers caregivers who do something that's actionable or who don't do something that's actionable. Another section of Title IX points out that abuse or neglect can be found where the caregiver created or allowed to be created a substantial or ongoing risk of physical injury to the child by other than accidental means. Hmm, is this the same one? No. Now, the next kind of abuse or neglect definition I want you to take a look at is a little bit different than the last one, although the language is very similar. This is 9 colon 6 dash 8.211 C2. And here the focus is on risk. If you recall, the prior slide talked about doing something, inflicting or allowing to be inflicted physical injury on the child other than accidental kind. This one involves creating or allowing to be created a substantial or ongoing risk of physical injury. So let's take a look at that last slide again for a second. You see here, this is inflicted injury where the injury actually occurs. 
where the caregiver does something or doesn't do something and there's injury. Taking a look at the next slide again, this is a risk of injury. Okay, so abuse or neglect can be found where the caregiver creates or allows to be created a substantial or ongoing risk of physical injury to such a child by other than accidental means, which would be likely to cause death or serious protracted disfigurement, etc. Now, I don't expect you to remember these definitions, not even close. What I do expect is for you to understand that there are these definitions and that the definitions dictate whether there's going to be a finding of abuse or neglect. That the division in these kinds of cases has to prove what's contained in these definitions. So when you have a factual scenario, you have to pull out the Title IX book and see what kind of abuse or neglect that you're going to proceed under. Now, to go back to my hypothetical where the woman leaves the baby in the stroller on the shoulder of Route 287, nothing happened to that child while she was in the crack house, okay? So the last one, the slide before, which talks about inflicting or allowing to be afflicted physical injury wouldn't apply. This one might apply, right? Because there is the risk of physical injury. Is it substantial? Is it likely to cause death or serious disfigurement? Darn right, if a baby carriage is on the shoulder of 287, which is a superhighway with cars flying by at 70, 80 miles per hour, a child could be killed instantly. So maybe this one is the right statute to proceed under. This one focuses on risk. Other potential liability in an abuse or neglect fact finding is contained in Title IX, colon 6 8211 c and it says the child's physical, mental, or emotional condition has been impaired or is in, again, those adjectives, you got to watch for those adjectives, or is in immediate danger of being impaired as a result of the parent doing things or not doing things. So the first part of the definition tells us that the child's physical, mental, or emotional condition has been impaired or is in immediate danger of being impaired because the parent neglects the child's food, clothing, shelter, education, or medical needs, or the child improperly supervises the child by inflicting unreasonable harm or using excessive corporal punishment. This is the corporal punishment statute, which we may take a closer look at later in this course or by other serious acts of willful or wanton neglect. So this is another kind of, abuse or neglect. And the focus here is on mental and emotional conditions as well as physical, but where the other statutes did not address mental or emotional danger, this statute addresses that. Other potential liability for abuse and neglect in child protection is sexual abuse on the child excessive physical restraints, which is related to corporal punishment, willful abandonment. Well, there's that willful abandonment. And remember I said that when we take the facts that we have in my hypothetical where the woman leaves the child in the stroller on the shoulder of Route 287, I said maybe neglect and maybe abandonment. But abandonment has sub-definitions. I'm not so sure it would fit, but it might. It might. The child may be characterized as being abandoned. So those are examples of abuse or neglect under New Jersey statutes, particularly Title IX of the New Jersey statutes. Again, while no one expects anybody to remember all of these statutes and their elements, and by no way is this the end of Title IX's descriptions of potential abuse or neglect, there are more sections within Title IX that describe abuseful, abusive or neglectful behavior. These are just some samples, some examples for you to think about when thinking about what a fact-finding hearing is all about. Because again, one issue for the court, either abuse occurred or it didn't occur. And if the division through the DAG is going to attempt to prove abuse or neglect, the roadmap, if you will, the roadmap, the instructions for the DAG, 
as to what that physical abuse or as to what that proceeding is going to look like are contained in Title IX's statutory definitions of abuse or neglect. And these statutory definitions, as I just suggested, are very nuanced and detailed. And if you're a worker that's going to testify in one of these cases, you need to do a lot of work. You need to review the case. You need to meet with the DAG. You need to think about the DAG's theory of the case. You know, are we going with abandonment? Are we going with neglect? What are the elements of the neglect? You know, what kind of theory of the case are you going to proceed under? What is the factual support for this? What are you going to focus on? Are you going to focus on where mom was, where the child was, how long the child was there? Probably all those things, but what is going to be emphasized? A worker needs to know these things before they testify in, in one of these cases. Next, I want to share with you a couple of evidence rules that are common in child uh, child protection proceedings in a fact finding. And they're contained in Title IX colon 6-8.46. And these are little evidentiary rules that DAGs often use to help prove their case. So one of them involves proof of the abuse or neglect of a different child can be admissible on the issue of the abuse or neglect of any other child. So in the case where the child was left on the roadside, let's say that that caregiver, that mom who was in the crack house, has a three-year-old daughter, as well as the infant who was in the stroller on the shoulder of 287. Well, the division has jurisdiction and can prove risk of harm to that other child. Proof of the abuse or neglect of the child on the roadside can be admissible on the issue of abuse or neglect of the other child. So that's a evidentiary strategy that's often used by DAGs. Another evidentiary tool that deputy attorney generals use and make up a fact-finding hearing or involves evidence that may be utilized in a fact-finding hearing is this one. Proof of injuries on a child that ordinarily would not exist except by reasons of the acts or omissions of a parent is prima facie evidence of abuse or neglect by the parent. And what we mean by that is imagine a case where you have a mom and dad, uh, they're the only people in the household. They have a 10 month old daughter who has a spiral fracture of the femur or the thigh bone. We don't know who did it. We don't know if mom caused the injury, dad caused the injury. In fact, mom, when interviewed, claims that the child fell off of the bed onto a carpeted floor, which the physicians who examined the child say is not only highly unlikely, but utterly implausible. It, it couldn't have happened that way. Nevertheless, we can't zero in on any particular act of abuse and neglect by the parent because they say, I don't know what happened. I don't know how the baby's thigh was injured. I don't know what's going on. Well, Proof of that kind of injury on a child that would not exist except by the omissions of the parent shifts the burden to the parent now. It doesn't mean the case is over, but this evidence rule allows the DAG to show to the judge that this injury could not have happened other than by the act or omission of the parents. And once the DAG is able to show that, hey, spiral fractures just don't happen unless the parent is asleep at the switch unless they're neglectful. Now the burden shifts, shifts to the parents who have to show why this is accidental or is not an act of abuse or neglect. This is something that is unknown in the criminal law. In the criminal law, a, a prosecutor has to show who did it. In order to show abuse or neglect, harm or risk of harm, the DAG can ask the judge to consider that the injury is one that ordinarily would not happen except by a parent who's not paying attention, who's not um, uh, 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 discharging their parental responsibilities, 
someone who was neglectful, who committed acts or omissions. Another thing I want you to be mindful of is that hearsay is inadmissible in the fact finding unless there's an exception. And remember, I told you a little bit about hearsay and I'll say it again. It's when a third party comes to court to say what someone told them for the truth of the matter. It involves a statement that's made outside the courtroom. So a classic case is when the worker comes in and says what the neighbor told them. The neighbor's not on the witness stand. The worker is telling us what a third party said outside the courtroom. And they want the judge to consider that. If the worker comes in and says, I hear screams, childlike screams coming from that house every night after midnight. Well, let's assume that that's admissible to help the judge make their decision. Well, that would be hearsay because the neighbor's not in the courtroom. The neighbor made the statement to the worker, the worker's repeating it in the courtroom. And the worker wants the judge to believe that it's true, that there are screams, childlike screams, that come from the family home after midnight on a daily basis. Well, that's not admissible unless there's some kind of exception, okay? Now, whether that neighbor statement would be admissible or not requires a little bit more information. More often than not, the division relies upon records, the pediatrician's records, the records from the emergency room, uh, the mental health records. And these records are hearsay. If a, if a psychologist conducts a bonding evaluation and they type it up and they give it to the division and the division gives it to the, to the judge in a fact-finding hearing, then the division expects the judge to rely on that report. And it's hearsay because the psychologist isn't in the courtroom. Any written document for that matter is hearsay because it can't be cross-examined and it's a statement that was made somewhere else. Even your own reports, even division workers' own reports are hearsay because they were prepared outside the courtroom and they're being offered in court for the judge to consider for their truthfulness. Now, in many cases, we don't need to worry about that in a fact-finding within the family court because the statute allows the reports and documents that the division relies upon from consultants to be admissible without regard to hearsay. And I'm not going to get into too much detail about that except to say that when the division consults and they routinely consult with the child's pediatrician, with the doctors in the emergency room. They routinely consult with mental health experts, with substance abuse experts. Those kinds of records are admissible even though they're hearsay. However, the court has to make a finding either that the record is the record of someone that DIFUS consults with and therefore is an exception under the statute or sometimes, for example, a police report or maybe a professional who the division does not routinely consult with but who prepared a report. Maybe there's a geneticist. For some reason, the geneticist's information is relevant and they prepared a report. If the division can show that that report is a business record and it's kept in the ordinary course of business, that the record is if the deputy attorney general can show that that record was made at or near the time if the DAG can show that that record was made at or near the time of the events that are described in the record and that that record was kept in the regular course of business and that the person who made the record had a duty to be accurate, then the record would probably be admissible under the business record exception. And the child protection statutes allow most hearsay records to be admissible in a fact finding hearing. However, Within those records, there's sometimes complicated information uh, 
or complicated opinions. For example, if a, a pediatrician's records are admitted. Now, if the pediatrician's records indicate that the baby was two years old and weighed 15 pounds and was in the fifth percentile, well, that information is factual. That's factual information from the pediatrician. That's going to be accepted by the court. There's not going to be any problems with that. Uh, these records are only admitted for the facts that are contained there, therein, the facts that are within the records. Any complicated opinions that are in the records, well, uh, the division is going to have to put a witness on. For example, if a, a medical record uh, concludes that there was um, failure to thrive or that the child suffered from fetal alcohol syndrome or some kind of sophisticated or complicated opinion is in the record, well, the business record exception is not going to work there. The court's going to require that that um, proponent of the information, that doctor, uh, in the example I gave you, uh, come in and be, be cross-examined. That doctor has to testify. Uh, for example, schizophrenia, if a record contained a conclusion that the, uh, the mom in the case was schizophrenic, uh, we're not going to rely simply on the hearsay statements uh, contained in the records. Uh, in those cases, uh, the um, a doctor is going to have to come in. Uh, but those are not your typical cases. Uh, in most cases, the records will be admissible. Uh, the last thing I want you to think about with regard to evidence rules is the child's past statements. The child's past statements about abuse are admissible. The child's past statements about abuse are admissible, but there has to be corroboration. The child's statement alone cannot form the basis for abuse or neglect by the court. There has to be some kind of corroboration. And the statements of the child are always admissible, okay? So there's no problems with children's statements being hearsay. They fit the definition, but in child protection matters, uh, the statements of children are always admissible. But if all you have are the child's statements about abuse and neglect, there has to be additional evidence that corroborates that. Here's more information about uh, records in a fact finding. As I told you, records and reports are hearsay. They're statements that are made outside of court. They're inadmissible unless there's an exception. Okay, um, they violate the rules prohibiting hearsay. And it's an issue of due process and fundamental fairness. I mean, the parents who are involved in this litigation have a right to challenge the witnesses against them. And sometimes the people that make statements have to come in and they have to be challenged. I told you about those kind of complicated opinions that require that uh, doctors and professionals come in. Well, the reason they come in when they're talking about fetal alcohol syndrome or failure to thrive or any of these complicated opinions, the caregiver has a right to cross-examine uh, the person who wrote that record. Now, there are forms that the division uses to get these records in. Uh, when you're talking about consultants, then the DAG is probably not going to use one of those forms. Uh, they're going to lay out what they call a foundation. They're going to produce evidence that the uh, person whose record is being offered into evidence is the kind of person who is a DIFUS consultant, and they'll ask a few more questions, and that DIFUS consultant's records will generally be admissible. Sometimes the court will require a certification, and the division has these forms that certify that the records were made at or uh, near in time to the information contained in it, that it was kept in the regular course of business, and that there was a duty to be accurate and honest. And those kind of certifications are used all the time, and very often they are stapled or accompany the records, and the DAG will move not only the record into evidence, but the certification by the hospital or the certification by the police chief or some other custodian of the records. Let's take a look at who's going to testify in the fact-finding trial. Well, a division worker will testify, uh, probably more than one worker if it's complex litigation. When the workers testify, uh, the issue again is whether abuse or neglect occurred. It's really the sole focus of the testimony. And the worker who testifies needs to be fully familiar with the file and any family history with the Division of Child Protection and Permanency. Uh, 
the burden of proof is preponderance of the evidence. We talked about burdens of proof earlier, uh, more probable than not, more likely than not, 51%. Uh, these are the kinds of analogies that are used to describe preponderance of the evidence. Uh, the DAG, the parent's attorneys, the caseworker, the caregiver, the law guardian, all of these people participate in a fact finding and they all are permitted to be heard by the court. Now the judge can find that abuse occurred if the division proved the case by preponderance of the evidence. If the judge makes that finding, uh, then the case continues in court with what we call compliance reviews. In other words, the case comes back to court periodically to see how uh, the parent is doing, what steps have been taken uh, to minimize or eliminate the risk of harm, uh, whether the parent is cooperating with that, where the child is, how the child's doing. Uh, those kinds of issues are addressed in these compliance reviews. If the division has improved the case, then the order of removal is dismissed and the division has to return the child to the caregiver. Now, having said that, if there's still concern about the child, the DAG can take other action, proceed under Title 30 perhaps, and uh, continue to uh, protect that child uh, in the family court. Um, uh, but the fact-finding litigation is over, and under Title IX, uh, the matter is closed. And absent any additional action by the division, the child has to be returned to the caregiver. So what are the kinds of issues for a witness who's testifying in a fact finding? Well, it's rather simple. What did the parent do that harmed the child? Or if the parent didn't do something, if they failed to do something, what was, um, what did the parent fail to do that harmed the child? Or what did the child do that created a risk of harm? or what did the parent fail to do that created risk of harm? You know, I think in the hypothetical that I was using throughout this uh, tutorial, where the mom left the child on the side of 287, uh, that's a risk of harm case. Probably the last two are the issues that are going to be front and center in the fact finding. That is uh, the parent's behavior that created the risk of harm um, or what the parent did not do uh, that created risk of harm. So I did not go over permanency hearings and termination of parental rights and guardianship. Uh, those are other forms of litigation within child protection. And they are very common as well, uh, especially the permanency hearings. But the ones that are relevant in nearly all Title IX cases are the initial filing and the fact finding. And I wanted to go over those in some degree of detail so that we all have an appreciation of, you know, what the common litigation looks like in child protection.